Okay. All right. Well, welcome uh, again. I'm broadcasting here from the mighty metropolis of Graham, North Carolina. Um, regulated back to a bedroom. That's kind of the, the thing that you're seeing here. I have a tremendous praise in that uh, this Friday or this past Friday, <clears throat> my brother and, and his wife and, and I were able to get my 93 year old mom out of her rehab uh, hospital. She had fallen and broken her hip and had gone through the, the rehab process and that's kind of difficult in the COVID-19 era in that you can't have any visitors. I mean, we would be able to go by and wave to her through a window and then have like a, an iPad and face Facebook or, or, you know, FaceTime between one another. And, but she is so happy to be home and sleeping in her own bed and we've got walkers and we built ramps throughout the house so that she can, can maneuver around. And so, uh, it's great to have her back. So uh, that's what I've been doing this weekend. And I'll, I've got mom watch this first week. So I'll be working out of uh, North Carolina and uh, keeping an eye on her. So, uh, so that's been, uh, been nice. <clears throat> we are uh, in Colossians. We're kind of wrapping up chapter two. I'll give a review. And I also want to talk about what happened yesterday. I don't know if many of you got a chance to to watch or listen in to the uh, the prayer on Washington, D.C. Uh, that was quite moving. Um, I think there's a, a lot that uh, we as a church, as the local church, need to embody and embrace this repentance and return to the Lord, right? For uh, we say as part of our constitution, our pledge to the flag that we are a nation under God. Well, we can't just honor God with our lips. We have to honor him with our hearts. And, and we can kind of see this, this conflict going on. I mean, there's this strife and, um, I believe our nation is under spiritual attack and it's time for, for we warriors in Christ, because we are to put on the full armor of God to, to kind of step up and, <clears throat> Actually, to a certain extent, that ties a little bit into today's lesson because Paul is writing this church in Colossa, and he's he's kind of if you gotta think back to first century Christianity, you know we we they're not blessed with what what we have that we have a, an internet that we have all these different resources and documents. I mean, we've had two thousand years to accumulate a, a very uh, stout library of people who've researched on Christianity and the principles and the precepts and, and God's word and been able to assemble not only a Bible, but we've got multiple translations of it in, in the sense of different, translated with different uh, cultural aspects. I mean, because if you read the King James Version, the original, which was written 1610, I mean, there's a lot of these and thous, which uh, sometimes words do change over history. So there's more modern versions. And so it's not just that one's better than the other. I think when we study scripture, we should look at several different versions to try to understand the passage. And so we're blessed with all that. They didn't have that back then. In fact, Paul would write a letter and people would would gather around and, and share it. And then they, they would have to, they didn't have any copiers back then. They had scribes who would write stuff down. And so uh, you get a piece of information and you would hold on to it. <clears throat> One of the benefits of that is that once you got... Uh, like a, a precept or a principle, you would hold on to it. And so I think there was the, the benefit of learning that, but you also were subject to uh, outside forces who were trying to provide a different interpretation. And what was happening here at, at this church, there were two, primarily two different groups. One we would typically call the Gnostics. These are people that, you know, kind of what we'd call the academic elite today, <laughs> uh, 
you know, that, that we have this higher view, you know, that, that we're smarter than everybody else. And, in, 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 you know, we're trying to explain what, uh, what Jesus's teachings were and what Christianity is all about. And then the other group was the Judaizers, which that made a logical sense in the in the fact that, you know, Moses had written the, the law, you know, a thousand years ago, or yeah, fifteen hundred years ago. And so they had lived with that for so long. And so even though Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, it's like, well, the law doesn't really go away. So you can follow Christ, but you still have to abide by all the rules and regulations in the Torah. And, and so Paul is writing to try to clarify against these two different thoughts. And, and this apparently seemed to be kind of a, uh, an ongoing thing because you'll see the same thing going on in, in his letter to the Galatians. You know, in fact, you foolish Galatians, why have you allowed these people to hoodwink you? You know, in other words, you know, stick grace uh, to the gospel. In fact, Paul is very emphatic in his letter to the Galatians where he says, if anybody preaches a gospel other than what I've taught you, let them be cursed. Yeah, that's pretty strong language, right? So uh, the gospel, <clears throat> quite simply, is a very simple message, but it's difficult to follow, okay? Because, in fact, it's virtually impossible to follow if you're trying to do it out of your own strength. You have to have that heart transformation. You have to allow the spirit and power of Christ to work through you to be able to follow him. Because if you try to do it through behavior modification, eh, it's just, just not going to work. So, so that's kind of the, the background <coughs> uh, of where we are right now. And um, just to kind of summarize where we got before we get into to this chapter, we, we've covered the fact that Paul, in his logical argument, he says, there's only one God. You know, there, there's only one person that you need to, to focus on, and that's Jesus Christ, because in him, for him, and through him, all things are created. So it's not Christ plus anything. It's not Christ plus, you know, another God, Zeus or Jupiter or other type stuff. It's not Christ plus, you know, following the law. It's not any of these other things. It's just Christ. That's all you need, right? Follow him. He, he is the way, the truth, and the life, you know, so just focus your, your whole being and emphasis on Christ and who he was, because <clears throat> as Christians in, in our walk, in fact, the early, um, I mean, the, the term Christian actually was kind of a derogatory term. It was kind of all of those Christians, you know. But the original description of the of the Christian faith, if you will, was called the way. That was what it was called. In other words, there's a lot of different ways. This is the way. And, and that's a great description of what Christianity is. It is the way. It, Yes, it, it, from an academic standpoint, it qualifies as a religion. But if you look at it from a religious point of view, you're looking at it the wrong way. It is, it is a way. It is a way of life. It is a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle with, of following Christ. And what we mean by following Christ is to be like him. And to be like him is to speak truth and do everything in love. And if we, we step back and look at the challenges of our culture, we don't see a lot of people speaking truth, and we certainly don't see a lot of people acting in love. I mean, looting is not a sign of love, right? And, and people are, are twisting the truth to kind of promote a, a narrative or an ideology, and this is happening on all sides. But, I mean, you know, understand there's persuasive kind of speech, but the focus should be on what is true. Right? What is true that would, would help out others? What and how do I have a value system that actually cares about other people? And that's what the Christian walk is all about, is that I try my best to understand truth. Paul even admits in his letter to the Corinthians, he says, 
Yeah, we see in a mirror dimly, so we don't know what the full truth is. In fact, we never will know. It requires omniscience to know all truth, right? Truth with a capital T. But we seek to find truth. You know, that's our goal. Uh, we, we, in personal experience, realize that when we've made decisions based on faulty information, it really never works out well, right? So we seek truth, and then we got to have a value system. And that value system is agape love, which agape love is simply, I have your best interest at heart, and you have mine. And we talked about that a lot last week, you know, that that we have this attitude that we're just here to help out our shipmates, to, to look after one another, and if we collectively work as a team in going forward through life, uh, we can handle any challenge, right? We can handle a coronavirus. We can handle these other things that, that come upon us because one, when people tell us these are things that we ought to do, we have the ability to trust them that they are true. And two, that we have this attitude that they have our best interest at heart. And that's one of the discouraging parts is that I don't know if we can say that now, right? You know, it used to be you could trust your doctor, your lawyer, your Indian chief, your pastor, you, you know, and it's like you get information nowadays and it's like you almost have to verify it or you almost have to question, is there kind of some hidden motive going on? And that's a dangerous place for us to be, right? And so this is an opportunity for us as the church to promote what truth is to promote what, what love is and, and what that means and, and that we don't have this hidden agenda. You know, it's the, the idea of that we are here to help out, to have this servant leadership type mindset of helping out one another. And this is kind of, this kind of theme you'll see in pretty much all of Paul's letters. You know, he, he addresses a problem and then kind of sets the benchmark or the style of this is how, it should be, and, and to work or to graduate or to move toward that, which is what sanctification and discipleship is, right? I mean, we are to grow in Christ. Okay, so summarizing what uh, we've covered so far is that we understand what the wealth of knowing God is. I mean, if we know who the creator of the universe is, wow, I mean, that, that's an incredible thing. And then and Paul has talked about revealing the mystery of God. And the mystery of God is this, that Jesus Christ died for everyone. And that whoever trusts and believes in him shall not perish. If you <clears throat> confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's Romans 10, 9. So that the mystery of God is, is that God just wasn't looking after the Jewish people. He was looking after all people, and Christ is the path. In fact, Christ even said he is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way in which we can uh, get ourselves right with God. You know, that we have by, by accepting Christ, that Christ comes, his spirit dwells inside of us, and that taps us into, I mean, we think it's great to have access to the internet. How about having access to all wisdom and all truth? I mean, we have that, that kind of relational connection with God. This allows us to become complete. You know, that's what uh, <clears throat> studying God's word, you know, that, that Paul says all scripture is inspired by God, available for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. That's 2 Timothy 3.16. The, the, the next verse says, so that the man of God or woman of God, kind of the human of God, may be fully complete for every good work. I mean, as, as we tap into the Spirit of God, or Christ, who is the Word of God, remember John says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. He is the Logos. We have all knowledge or access to all knowledge and all truth, and that allows us to, to let that radiate outside of us. And in, in, in terms of our spiritual walk, it's tapping into that inner voice. I think I've taught this in this class before. If you think about um, 
three concentric circles. You got a big outside circle, a middle circle, and a small inner circle, and that kind of represents the the trifecta of mankind. You know, our physical, our mental, emotional, and our our spiritual. And so we receive information from the outside. We receive that through our five senses of, of touching, of seeing, of hearing, of smelling, tasting, that type of stuff. That information then gets processed in our mental and emotional state, and then we provide a response. This is kind of the, the human process of receiving information and responding information. What's going on inside of us at the spiritual level? Well, if, if we're not consciously connected to, to the that small voice is often call, called or that conscience or that that spirit within inside of us we kind of ignore it but if we can adjust our walk if we can co- have, create this kind of pause or be able to tap into what the spirit and then allow once we receive this information and process and it seek guidance from the spirit and then let that then flow out from us that's a sign of a more mature christian is being able to process information you know seek the wisdom and counsel of the holy spirit and then provide the response and it's like a muscle you know the more you practice it the more it becomes second nature to you It, it, it kind of starts off kind of with fits and starts but if you have that kind of ability now you're growing in the faith of Christ and, and you have that ability to start seeing the world from a kingdom of God perspective, to look at, to put God's spectacles on your eyes, right? And, and see things for how he sees, sees things, because quite honestly, that's how we want to be, right? If, if we're trying to follow Christ, then we would like to see the world as he sees the world and be able to react and respond to that. Okay. Now we talked about this the other week, that the, the burial of baptism, that we went down dead and come up alive in Christ. That kind of shows that the old nature of us is put away. We now put on the new nature of Christ. We are resurrected with him through faith. We get to live with him forever. I mean, that's that confidence that we have that, uh, Hey, we're winners. We talked about that last week as well, that that we have this attitude as we go through life that despite all the trials and tribulations and watching Georgia Tech play football, which is an extreme trial and tribulation. But, you know, as we go through these types of things, we have this confidence that in the end, we are going to win, that we have forgiveness of sin and, and see That gets us out of this law mentality that, oh, I've got to pay for stuff. No, Christ paid for it all. We sing that in church, you know, that he paid for all our sins. And so that's not a license to go out and sin. And that's where Paul talks about that in in chapter 6 of of Romans. You know, he says, well, heck, if I sin, I get more grace, and maybe I should sin more so I get more grace. And he's like, no, may that never be. He says, you know, you're, you're being freed from having to sit there and go through life worried about whether you're disobeying the law. He says, that's the wrong mindset. Have the mindset of Christ. You're following him, and if you're following him and you're doing things out of love, guess what? You don't really even need to pay attention to the law because if you're doing things in love, you fully comply with the law. And that, that's the amazing statement of the greatest commandment, that if you love God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, you comply with all the rules, all the laws, all the prophets. Everything is summed up in that verb. So it, it, instead of sitting there, well, did I... Did I sin? You know, you're trying to figure out how close to sin can I get without going over. That's the wrong mindset. It's it's that if I'm going forward and, and trying to do things in love and speaking truth and helping out one another, then that is full compliance of the law. And then when we have that kind of attitude, the Holy Spirit, remember Jesus in the uh, John 15, he gives an analogy that I am the true vine and you guys are the branches. He says, so you must abide in me. You must stay connected to me. You know, his spirit's inside of us. That's what we're talking about. You stay connected to Christ inside of you that you'll produce much fruit. 
Okay, and Galatians 5.22 tells us what the fruits of the Spirit are. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That against these things, there is no law, right? So if, if we're abiding in Christ, if we're following him, if we have this attitude of promoting truth and, and doing things in love, then we're going to produce this wonderful fruit of love and joy. We're going to have that peace that Paul says that passes all understanding, that we have the confidence that we are our winners. You know? And this is what was being challenged in the church at Colossa. People were saying, no, yeah, yeah, Christ is cool. Yeah, we get all that, but you got you to gotta pay attention to the other gods. I mean, you can't ignore them. And uh, that's not true. You know, <clears throat> I mean, we kind of see a little bit of that, I guess, in, in like some of the Eastern Orthodox religions to a certain extent. I mean, in their icons or, or they have... Uh, a saint for each day that you pray through. I mean, from uh, the Protestant perspective, there's a little concern of Catholicism and the Mariology, you know, how, how they've kind of elevated her. You know, it's kind of like you, you pray to Mary to ask her son to do stuff, and, and, and that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches, Hebrews 4, 16, uh, says, Hey, yeah, you can go directly to the throne of grace with confidence, right? That, that there is only one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 2, 5, right? So, so we can go directly to Christ. We can go directly to the source and be able to, to lay it out, you know, because I believe God, of all things, appreciation appreciates honesty integrity i mean if you're having a tough time tell him right that's the beauty of it is that we can pour out our hearts with integrity because we have complete trust in god and the reason why we have complete trust in god is because he has a love for us that we can't even describe think about that 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 God loves us so much, not only did Christ die for us, we, and there is no greater love than this than one to lay down his life for his friends, John 15, 13, but it's just, it goes off the charts. I mean, it is beyond human comprehension to understand how God loves us. And we see, even today, th there's kind of this, this legalism that exists today within the church, and you know, that God is going to punish you, you know, that, that, no, I mean, yeah, God does discipline those whom he loves, just like any good father would, would do that to his child, but, but God, his first and, and natural reaction is love, and he is doing everything uh, possible while still allowing us the freedom of choice. He's doing everything possible to say, look, this is the right way. I'm giving you the freedom to choose how you get to want. Every person that ends up in hell chose to be there because God gave him the way. God gave him the path. God said, you can choose me. I'm here. And, and, but I'm giving you the freedom to choose that if you choose to reject me, I'll give you your way there. So, I mean, really it comes down to at the, at the end of the age, we will either say to God, thy will be done, or God will say to us, thy will be done. Right? That, that's how it'll end up turn, turning out. And, and so our mission is, one, to grow in Christ and to become more like him that, that radiates that love that, that's, that's just co so compelling that Francis Chan says, like, crazy love. You know, just that, that we create this, this draw toward other people. And... Um, you know, that, that's who we're, we're trying to be. <clears throat> and, and just to go out there and, and radiate that kind of love to be a bright light to the world. And that's what we're trying to accomplish here. And that we have this reconciliation, rest, restoration, relationship with God, and this freedom from the disarmed rulers and demonic forces and victory. Okay, so that's kind of an interesting one because Paul tells us in... Ephesians chapter 6, you know, to put on the full armor of God. Even though we're victorious in the end, 
there's still kind of some some mop up battles that are that are having to go on, and and so we need to be prepared as we go through until Christ returns and sets up His kingdom. That we put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. We carry the shield of faith, the belt of truth. We shot our feet with the gospel of peace. We carry the sword, which is the word of God, which is truth. You know, and we do all things praying in the spirit. So that's that's our armor that that prepares us to go forward, so that we can have the wisdom and insight to battle legalism that that's coming into the church, different arguments that God's not really all that good or that he's looking to punish you. No, that's not who God is. God is, a, is God is love. First John four, eight. I mean, that, that's not that he is loving certainly that, but that is the very nature of who he is and, and his desire is the best for you. You know, one of my favorite verses is, uh, Psalm 37, 4, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know, and, and so first, when, when I started meditating on that verse, I was like, you know, so, so how do I delight myself in the Lord, right? Well, you know, I love his precepts. I love his law. I love reading his word and, and having that aha moment, you know, when I discover something. But, you know, Initially, as an immature Christian, uh, I would look at that and says, well, here's kind of a formula to get what I want, right? In other words, if I delight myself in the Lord, then he will give me the desires of my heart. In other words, those are my desires, right? So here's what I want to do, so I'm going to delight myself however I need to do that, so I'll get my desires, like like God's a genie, right? That he will, ah, here's the magic formula, delight yourself, then God gives you what you want. It's not what that verse means. What that verse means is that if we surrender, remember Paul talks about that, that we are to be a living sacrifice, that if if we have that complete trust in God, that if we surrender to him, then he will place his desires in our heart. And if you think about that, that's what we want, right? I mean, it's not like we can look at God and say, you know, God, that's a good idea, but I got a better one. I mean, no one can do that, right? So, we have this ability to, to open ourselves up, to become a living sacrifice. That's that surrender. That's that submitting that we do to, to God because we trust in him with all our heart and we don't lean on our own understanding and he'll direct our path. And so if we open ourselves up, you know, Jesus even said, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Right. In other words, if, if you purify your heart, there's a correlation between how pure your heart is or how trusting it is to God and how much he can use you. So if we give him all of our heart, then God can use us. And when it says we can see God, we can see what God is doing. And that actually would be our goal. Right. To be able to see what God is doing in the world and go join in on the fun. Right. I mean, Jesus even said that. He says, I don't do anything of my own accord. I see what the father is doing and I go and do also. We should have that same mindset, you know, it, that it, that we try to open up ourselves and let let the spirit flow out of us. Christ, the Holy Spirit, flow out, producing this wonderful fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and be able to, to demonstrate that to the world and then have. The eyes of God, the kingdom of God. You know, Paul even says that Second Corinthians four eighteen. He says, you know, fix your eyes not on the seen but on the unseen. For the seen is temporary, but the unseen is eternal. And what he's saying is, is have this perspective or my, a kingdom of God mindset. Have that kingdom of our God value system. What's that value system? Is to love others, to consider others better than ourselves, and, and to put other people first in that servant type. Uh, leadership or attitude. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's kind of the mindset that we are to have. We're going to be challenged by legalists. We're going to be challenged by people that says, you know, the law. I mean, I, I think even even some pastors today uh, kind of get scared about preaching about grace because they are afraid. Of, just as Paul says, you know, if I say that, hey, your sins have been paid for. Maybe they have this attitude that, woo, I can go live how I want. You know, I just get more grace the more I sin, and, and, and that's not the mindset, right? 
it, it would be like being on a football team and says, well, hey, the coach allows me to fumble, so let me fumble as many times as I can, you know? That's not how we do it, right? N- nobody wants to do that. People want to do well. People want to, to strive for excellence and, and to do these type of things. And and it has to be a heartfelt thing. If, if your heart has been transformed such that God is first in your life, then you're going to follow that. And so as we think about the legalism today, you know, there's some challenges about whether women should become pastors and there's other different things that, that, that go on. And maybe that's not legalism, but we need to kind of address those type of issues and think about things and, and think of how Christ would handle things and how we should respond. But the main thing, the, the most important thing, and as <clears throat> the message, if you got a chance to watch it yesterday, that whether you're a Republican or Democrat or independent or, or whatever else, and whether you like Trump or like his slogan to make America great again, the thing of it is, is this, we cannot make America great without God, period. End of story. You know, if, if we do not have God first in our hearts, this nation will go under, you know, and that's the kind of the key. And, and honestly, you know, uh, they talked about the, the Mayflower Pact and how this, this nation was founded upon Christian principles. And it is upon Christ that anything successful can be built. And without him, we're building on sand. And so we can have the biggest economy. We can have all these type of things. But if we do not have our heart on God, we'll be just like the Israelites and we will fall. And uh, that's the challenge to our church today, the church, the universal church, the Catholic church, in the sense of the body of Christ. It's time for us to step it up and to be that bright light and say, look, you know, we, we, we know we got some issues. We know we got some problems. But let's, let's start trying to love one another. And, and love squirts in the grease, the, the gears of culture and society to kind of keep things moving forward. And uh, that's what we need to do. So uh, that's my time. So I'll open it up to the questions. Everybody fall asleep. I mean, I know uh, maybe I should market these, you know, for if you suffer from insomnia, watch this video. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll sum it up. I, I've enjoyed this kind of different teaching in Zoom. I look forward to, I guess, in January, I'll be back in this class and hopefully we'll be physically together because I, I much prefer that over this current method. But uh, I admire the Seekers class for, for going out and, and maintaining this connection and let's use the technology that's available to at least stay in touch and encourage one another and uh, – you know, God bless us all, and, and hopefully soon uh, this trial will pass and we can get together. The koinonia, the fellowship, will uh, return it at our church. In full Great capacity. lesson. Okay, and we're, we're happy about your mom, too. Yeah, well, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it'll be a fun couple of weeks while I hang out here. And then my sister... Uh, She's recovering from injuries as well, so she's on injured reserve, but hopefully she'll be able to, to come in a couple of weeks in, uh, through this post-rehab process and uh, get her up and going again. We've enjoyed your life.